from the Bay Area, I want to introduce second year MBA student Asad Kamani. Asad? Hi everyone, I hope we're all ready for our second set of presentations. Um, first, I'd like to welcome Kent Lake up to the stage to talk about being the GM of a G League franchise. Hey guys, how's it all going? How's it going? Um, first off, thanks. I just want to give a quick thanks to Patrick Reich. Uh, Pat, thanks for setting all this up. I know you put a lot into this, and the, the event's grown the last couple of years. It's been awesome to, to see it come together. So thank you. Um, show of hands, who here thinks they have interest in working in professional sports in some capacity? A lot of you. All right, that makes sense. Um, and who here has thought about wanting to work in a front office for a professional sports team or would want to be a GM? Okay, so I'm going to put a couple of you on the spot here. What's your name? Adam. Adam. What do you think a GM does? What are some, just name one of the responsibilities you think of, of, of a GM. Player management. Player management. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Uh, what's your name? Kelton. Kelton. What else does a GM do? Overseeing the coaching staff. Can I get one more person? Payroll. Payroll. Yeah. So those are all. Those are all definitely three big parts of it. Um, the reason I bring this up is, I think there's a, a public-facing part of it where managing the roster and uh, working with the coaching staff. Those are the big things. But there's a lot that goes into a, to being a GM that I've learned that I didn't know. And so for those of you who have interest, my, my only hope here today is to try to help lay, lay the foundation for what are some of the other things that go into it. It won't be everything. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to move pretty quick through, through this. I'm going to blow through it because ultimately I want to talk about whatever it is that interests you guys. So I'm going to try to save as much time as I can for questions. But... Um, before I get started, I'm just going to backtrack for a second and talk about how it kind of started for me. Um, when I was five years old, my mom got my brother and I a, a plastic Fisher-Price basketball hoop that we put in the entry hall of our house. And from that point on, I, I became obsessed with basketball. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I had a passion for the game. And I think that's how it starts for most people with sports is before... There's everything else that goes into it. There's just a passion for something and, and having fun with, with the game, whichever one that is for you. But um, I had a, a, a little bit of a weird uh, childhood phase in the sense that uh, I became so obsessed with my Fisher-Price hoop that my mom had to put a restriction on how, much, how often I was allowed to play because I'd wake up at 6 a.m. on the weekends and start bouncing the ball and wake people up. And uh, my mom definitely regretted the decision to put the, the hoop inside after that. But I actually, uh, I specifically remember as a kid, I had an imaginary league that I created where I called it the Kent League. And I created teams uh, from different cities. There was a narrative for each team. When I played the games, I did the color commentary while I was playing. I, I traded players from one team to another. It's all pretty weird, I understand. <laughs> um, but the point is, I, uh, I, I had a passion for this early on uh, that I couldn't really describe. But when I fast forward and I see where I am now, I can't honestly say that it was my dream to be a GM of a team because I didn't really know what a GM was at the time. And even when I got the job uh, to, to be the GM of Santa Cruz about two and a half years ago, at that point, I thought I knew what went into it. But I've quickly learned that I really, even then, didn't know everything that a GM does. And it's a lot more than some of those preliminary things you talk about. So all I'm trying to do today is, is help give you a, a few little insights into what I do. And uh, hopefully it can spawn some questions and we can talk about anything that interests you guys. Um, but uh, what I did is create an extremely cliche basketball reference. And I'm going to give you the starting five core elements of what I think uh, goes into being a, a GM or some of the things that I do. And the first one is generally managing people. And there's constructing the roster, scouting and talent evaluation, player development, and operations and logistics. So I'll go in just really quickly. I'm not going to dive too deep into it, but I'll go quickly through all of these. So the first one, 
uh, generally managing people, um, there's a reason it's called a general manager. And that's because a lot of what you do is general in nature. You are hiring a, a staff, uh, and, and the people you work with are going to be in more specialized roles. And it's important to have an understanding, and you'll quickly learn that you cannot you can, nobody, first off, nobody likes a micromanager, but it's impossible to try to micromanage everything because the people you're going to hire to, to perform specific roles are, by definition, more qualified to do those things than you. So um, uh, what I've found is it's important to just hire your best staff, which, which means people that you can communicate with and people you can have a, relation, a working relationship with based on mutual respect, understanding that while you're establishing expectations, for you know, what's, what's the, the plan that we're all working towards. Ultimately, you're hiring people to autonomously do their jobs. So at the end of the day, make the hire, uh, establish effective lines of communication, and be there for guidance, support, advice. But at the end of the day, let the coaches coach. Let the, let the trainer be in charge of what's going on in the training room. Let the strength coach manage the weight room. And do that and, and be there and always be available. And that, that tends to be a better solution than, than if, well, you know, what I tried to do early on was go in and try to be super involved in everything. That can, that can set up problems. Whereas if you let people who uh, you hired to do a specific job do their job, uh, it can be a lot more effective. The other, the other component of, of generally managing things is just fostering and developing relationships. There are a, a large part of your day is going to be really just staying in touch with people, developing a relationship with someone, fostering it, and then trying to maintain. And this is just a few examples of, of the big things, but you know, players, you're, you're working with your players and you wanna be able to talk to them about basketball and non-basketball related things. Same with the coaches. Each player has an agent and uh, you're gonna talk to them whenever it comes to contract related matters. So developing some kind of relationship with them is important. Other GMs you're gonna have to work with uh, and there's, you know, in the G League, there's 28 teams now. So that's 27 other uh, people that you're probably going to want to connect with on a, maybe not a, a daily basis, maybe not a weekly basis, but, you know, every once in a while you want to be staying in touch about things so you know what's going on. Um, you're talking to scouts to get information on, uh, scouts and college coaches to get information on current players, on, on potential future players, um, and just try to get as much information as you can. So a lot of relationships that you're just trying to manage over the course of time. Um, second, constructing the roster, and this is what we talked about, one of the, the, the more fun parts, the more kind of public-facing parts that you'll see, but um, what's interesting about the G League, and I think minor league sports in general, is it's not always black and white as to the decisions you make, if they'll be good or bad for your team, and that's because it's really important to identify the organizational uh, goals and needs for your specific team. So... Um, you know, a decision we make for what we want to do in Santa Cruz based on the needs of the Golden State Warriors might be very different than what uh, the Orlando Magic or the Detroit Pistons are trying to do right now. So it's not uh, that each decision is made in a vacuum as, as absolutely good or bad. It's going to depend on what the needs and goals are of that team. Um, and and what, what that comes down to is understanding the, big, the bigger picture is there may be times where you have to make a decision that might not be conducive to helping your G League team win games necessarily, but it might be in the best interest of the organization as a whole. Maybe if it aids the development of one of your young, young players. Um, those are decisions that, you know, it's, it's tough to put your competitiveness, uh, your competitive nature to the side and try to think about what is best for the team in the long run that's going to have an impact for our NBA club. And that's ultimately what we're there for. Um, so, so that's big is just, you're not always going to get it right, but trying to have an understanding of what the big picture is. Um, and then the last thing I've learned is just to always expect the unexpected. So the, there's, there is simply no way you can predict with, with how much roster overturn there is in minor league sports to try to predict everything that's going to happen and map out a plan. You can do that and you should but it is not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. Someone's going to get called up if they're playing well. Someone might get injured at any point. Um, someone might get bought out and decide to go overseas. And a lot of things you just won't see coming. So just being prepared to, to, make, uh, to adapt on the fly and be ready to make a decision uh, on a moment's notice, it's tough, but it's, uh, it's, it's a part of the job. 
Um, third, scouting and talent evaluation, um, which is, it's a lot of fun to, to get to go fly around the country and see college games and see other pro games and, and do scouting, but there's a little bit of a conflict that comes in with this because trying to be present with your team but also being oriented towards the future at the same time are two things that, that tend to clash a little bit. Um, you want to be locked in to what's going on with your team. You want to be focused on the present, tuned into your locker room, seeing which players are, are fitting and, and you know, matching with the system that you're playing. But at the same time, uh, scouting is a year-long process. And if you want to be prepared for what's going to, to, to happen in the stages of roster construction at the beginning of the next season, there's going to be a whole new batch of rookies who are playing all over the country in college. There's going to be players coming from overseas. There's going to be uh, players on other teams in the G League. And so trying to find a balance that's right for being engaged with your team in the present, but also being oriented towards the future, it's tough, and there's no right or wrong way to do it necessarily, but just having that in mind is an important distinction. Um, being a G League GM, whether it's in your title or not, you're effectively going to be a, scout, a director of scouting for the minor league um, for your NBA club, or if it's baseball for, for, the, M, for the major league club. Um, and that's because uh, ultimately there's prospects who are down in the G League. And it's not just on your team, but it's all over. And as the person who's running that team, you are more locked in than anyone else in the organization to what's going on in the G League at a given time. So you always have to be prepared to, to give your feedback. If Bob Myers were to come to me tomorrow and say, we're thinking about calling up a player, who do you suggest? You need to have an answer for that. So um, always trying to be uh, aware of what's going on in the league and, uh, and following every team, not just your own. Um, and then the last thing on this, uh, uh, there's a, our assistant GM, who's a, a longtime scout and coach and uh, has been in the industry for a long time. One of the first things he told me when I first started scouting was don't watch three games at the same level of play in a row without breaking it up and watching another. Uh, level. So that's really stuck with me because it's easy when you're managing a G League team to get really focused in and locked in on the G League like I was just talking about before. There's so much information to process. But at the same time, if you're only watching G League basketball or if you're only watching uh, AAA baseball, then it's easy to lose a frame of reference for how does this translate to the NBA? Or how does a college player translate effectively to the G League as you're looking for that next transition? So trying to keep a frame of reference, if, if any of you guys have interest in working in basketball, I would advise watch as much basketball as you can of all different kinds of levels. Watch NBA, watch college, watch some G League games if you can, even high school, and that'll help frame your perspective of, okay, how does a player translate from one level to the next? Um, player development is the, the league used to be called the developmental league and though it's now been changed and Gatorade is the title sponsor, the G League is still a developmental league in nature and we've got a lot of young players who are, who are promising prospects and we bring guys in who we have long term interest in and we try to develop them to play in the NBA uh, for our, our given team. What's, oh, sorry. What's tough is winning when it comes to trying to win and trying to de develop players, those two are conflicting concepts. Um, so like I mentioned before, there's going to be, there might be some decisions you have to make in terms of one decision you could take might help you win more games, and another route you could take might help with the future development of an individual skill set or ability to play with your team. And there isn't, again, there is no right answer, there's no magic formula for it, but finding the right balance for your team that makes sense um, that's what's important. The way the Warriors try to look at it is we don't want to sacrifice one for the other. While the ultimate goal is not necessarily to win games for us, we do care about establishing a winning culture. And we want our players to know that we care about winning. We care about competing and playing to win. Even if the win or loss happens at the end of the day, that might not be what's ultimately important. But the fact that they care for us, that will aid in development. And um, the goal long term, at, at the end of the day, we want to look back on the season and we want to see the players improved. But to, to get to that point, we want to make sure that they're focused on improving themselves but also being a part of playing the role on the team. Um, whatever you do, what I learned by trial and error is 
have a specific strategy for how you want to do it, whatever it's going to be, and stick to that strategy. The first year I came in as GM, I had 15, 20 different ideas, all these things I was going to implement as far as how we could structure our player development program and add new things in that we were going to do and try, try all this stuff. Well, it's very difficult to make even one change. So, and I think this can apply outside of sports. You can probably apply to anything. If you go in guns blazing and try to change a whole, a, a whole lot at one time, it's very difficult, difficult to make those implementations, and you'll get a lot that's lost under the way. But if you start with a specific strategy, one or two things, and you make sure that that's your focus, it's a little bit easier to accomplish that. The last thing is operations and logistics. Um, this is... Is not the most fun part to talk about, uh, but it is probably what we spend the most amount of time doing is just the simple things. Get everyone where they need to be, when they need to be there. Get them what they need, when they need it. And, um, and, and how, how much uh, effort and emphasis you put on that does a large part in establishing your brand or your reputation as a team um, because it's, it's important that you know, if, if a player, if we're, if we're struggling with our ground transportation to get players to a flight or we're not all taken care of in terms of having our gear in order and, or having our expenses all over the place, that will have a reflection on how your team is perceived and, and the, how the player experience will be. So everything we do on the operations and logistics side is aimed at trying to improve the player and coaching staff experience so that they don't have to worry about any of that. They know it's taken care of and they can just go out there and focus on performance. Um, that's a quick snapshot. I, wanna, I know I blew through some of that, but I want to leave as much time as I can for questions. So uh, I want to open up the floor. If it's about what I talked about, that's great. If it's about anything unrelated, that's fine too. I just want to be here to answer any questions that you guys might have. Yeah. Uh, how did you first break into the basketball industry? How did I break into the basketball industry? Well, um, my path was admittedly a bit different because, um, because in 2011, my father bought the team, the Golden State Warriors. So um, I did have a, f uh, a foot in the door that a lot of people don't necessarily have access to. I don't shy away from that. Um, but I, I did know that I loved basketball. I didn't know exactly what capacity I would go. I played here at Wash U, um, and uh, I initially, I was working another job right uh, part-time when I finished uh, school, but I had, I had volunteered in the video room for two summers uh, leading up before I graduated and just cut film and basically kind of had the opportunity to hang around the facility and ask if anyone needed help, and I got to do a, a little bit of draft video prep. And from there, I established some relationships, and uh, it, you know, between that and my connection, it, it developed into a, a full-time role uh, on the basketball operations side when I came out of college. And, uh, you know, my role has changed a lot over the past, over the past three, four years. But um, initially, that was my foot in the door. And then I just tried to carve out a niche of where I could try to find value. But... Uh, how big is the difference of like, being GM and a GD team compared to like, an NBA team? Like, what are like, some key differences? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so the question was, what's the difference between being a G League GM and an NBA GM? Uh, there's a lot of differences. It's definitely a different role. Um, you know, there are some similarities in terms of you talk about the, putting a roster together and um, you know managing the staff. But um, what's different about the G League is, I think, the level of uncertainty uh, in terms of what the specific goals are for your team, and then also. Um, you know, you put an NBA roster together and it's much more high stakes because it's millions of dollars instead of thousands of dollars in, in terms of every part of the operation. But you're putting a roster together of, you know, million dollar players, and, uh, but they're locked into fully guaranteed deals or multi-year deals. And uh, at the G League level, you have players coming in who don't want to be there and who are ultimately, you recognize your goal is to try to get them out. You're trying to bring them in and then get them back up to another level. Um, so the way you have to approach uh, the players that you do sign, how you bring them in, how the ways that you communicate and work with them, it's just a little bit different in the sense that, you know, there are different goals in mind. There's a lot more individualism 
uh, because you have to convince players to buy into the team concept when ultimately their reason for being there is to try to get, get out of there and get called up to something bigger and better. So I think the biggest thing is just trying to understand and relate to the players that you, know, you can't just be preaching team, 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 team. You, have to, you still want everyone to buy in, but it's a unique approach in that buy into the team because if you guys all do that, it will make everyone look better. And we're all here trying to improve and move up. And that's the goal. That's what we're here to try to help you do. At the NBA level, it's more so um, it's an incredibly difficult task. But you're trying to get every, everyone is bought in and bonded together once they're under contract to a certain extent. And they're trying to achieve a certain goal. There's just a little bit more than winning that goes into the G League. Uh, and I'd say that's, that's one of the main, main differences. Uh, Taylor. How does your experience as an athlete affect some of those decisions you make My experience as an athlete? Um, I would say it definitely made a huge impact on my life. I, I had a great opportunity to play under Coach Edwards, who's in the stands here. Um, honestly, this is a bit of a strange answer, but I think what probably helped me the most was the fact that I sat on the bench for the first couple years that I was at Wash U and faced the adversity of, of trying to be in a place where I wasn't necessarily, I loved my team, I loved my teammates, but I wasn't happy in my role individually. Um, and, was, and facing that adversity that, you know, is something that sports simulates adversity. Um, and working through that helped me because I now, when I, when I put a roster together, I think otherwise it'd be, it might be too easy to look at just focusing on our core three or four top players and you know, be focused on, okay, they help us win, but I do feel I can empathize with guy one through 12 on the roster and knowing, knowing what it's like to be in that position where, um, where you're not playing, but you're still trying to help that guy find a way to contribute to the team, I think that's what helped was I learned over the course of my career playing in different roles, you know, going from not playing at all to playing a little bit to, to you know, being in the rotation of understanding, okay, there's a way to help a team no matter what role you're in. And I think having been through it, I can relate to the players a little bit more in, in, just, in just trying to communicate, okay, this is where you're at, but let's work through what's the best thing, how are you going to respond to that. Um, that's what I found to be helpful, but you know, I think you'd get a million different answers from anyone else uh, you know, who, who was in that position. So, Anyways, thank you guys. Appreciate it.